parametric design and um, fabrication to kind of put um, digital objects out into the world. And a lot of that has been through uh, public art opportunities. Um, and this is not moving now, hold on a second. There we go. And um, one of the big things I've been really interested in is this question of um, kind of making and um, making with the computer. So uh, a lot of these projects I think are focused on this kind of continuity between um, a kind of concept and construction. And some of them really push um, to be kind of inclusive all the way from like an initial idea all the way to a kind of construction document or a kind of fabrication capability. Um, and, um, and so, you know, one of the things that I think's really interested me is, is um, uh, this is a set of images from David Pye, who uh, back in the 60s was talking a lot about uh, workmanship and its relationship to craft. Um, and I'm really interested in him as uh, a craftsman who has a lot to say about the um, um, ways of making and how that could be a jumping off point for thinking about um, digital making. And so um, the projects that I've been doing have started off really small and have slowly kind of evolved into things that are slightly larger. Um, uh, and so I'm just gonna show a few really quickly here at the beginning, but this is um, the Oregon Environmental Council's bike bill that we did um, a, about a year and a half ago uh, with some students at school. Um, and this whole thing was um, using Grasshopper to scan um, uh, a person on a bike and translate that into a series of pipes that register essentially a figure riding uh, a bicycle. Um, and this thing was, uh, was built and put over on campus. Um, uh, but a short little thing, I didn't really focus on that. But one of these, uh, uh, one of the aspects of what I've been trying to do is trying to help um, connect, I think, um, the students to um, these ways of, of, of thinking, ways of making as well. Um, so this is a project, a little installation back in 2017 for RAC, uh, the Regional Arts and Culture Council, Regional Arts and Culture Council. Um, and this was uh, really early on in Grasshopper trying, um, making a proposal for what I call the stacked toroid, um, which was uh, a really simple means of construction, essentially like kind of pick up sticks or kind of stacking but then to um, do that in a way that was uh, really, um, let's say advanced or, or more complex in terms of the relationships to try and make an overall um, controlling figure. Uh, and in that case, it was the toroid. So you can see on the left, it's kind of dancing through. Those are um, the uh, construction documents which were generated out of Grasshopper. Um, and then this kind of um, uh, rapid uh, fire installation over here. And you can see, you know, this whole thing was about, um, uh, was up for maybe three or four weeks, but we also had a window of 48 hours to install it. So we had to go in there and find a way to construct this thing really quickly. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was that. Uh, and there's the, there's the installation. Um, but this was all kind of generated through Grasshopper to kind of find all those connection points and, and understand how those uh, pieces would all go together and develop a system for um, organizing it so we could uh, um, implement it really rapidly. Um, uh, this is another small project I did um, for a very small budget, I think um, like $3,000. So something really small. And this was a temporary, um, uh, installation at the Wilsonville Festival of Arts uh, a few years back. Uh, in this one, I was really interested in looking, um, this is the first time I tried to do it all the way from kind of, um, uh, kind of concept to construction and try to get the entire process embedded inside of Grasshopper. Um, that algorithm is so insanely complex, it didn't even seem worth to show the, um, the, the, the definition. Um, but this goes from um, a, um, a uh, trigonometric um, function, which is the equivalent of like a gyroid, which is a triply periodic mathematical surface, um, which was then kind of reduced down to a kind of low poly representation of that that would match the budget and allow me to explore some of the plugins to Rhino, um, relate, uh, to Grasshopper related to mesh uh, organization and, uh, and specifically Ivy, um, which is a kind of panelization and tab uh, uh, Feature. So, um, so all of that uh, got translated into sheet metal um, and 
uh, coded, riveted, um, painted, and then ultimately put out um, on site for um, for this one uh, this one weekend. Um, so that was a really quick thing, but uh, in this case, trying to look at surface um, definition rather than um, sort of stacked uh, linear elements. Um, there have been a few that haven't really gone anywhere and have kind of failed. Um, this is an attempt to do uh, a, a bridge proposal in Fort Worth. Uh, we thought it was a pretty good idea. We had it all kind of worked out about how the, um, this twisting form that would be clad in metal uh, was going to play out, but um, didn't, didn't win that one. Um, this is another one that didn't go anywhere. This is a kind of chandelier project that we were going to do in Denver, hanging inside of a renovated office building. Um, and I think that thing is like 15 feet tall, maybe 20 feet tall on the right. Um, but a sort of uh, self-contained object. Um, and you, while it does not literally spin, uh, you would be able to kind of move, move around it as you're moving through um, the space. And you'll notice in a lot of these, um, I, I've noticed I have this weird tendency to like rely on um, rotation to uh, uh, explore a lot of these projects or kind of describe them. So there are lots of turntable um, uh, things going on in here. Um, because uh, I think it's really hard to see the effect um, just from a single static image. So a lot of this is looking at um, a kind of rotation to see the changes as they, as you move around an object. Um, so uh, these next few are um, larger projects. Um, I've been trying to do these, uh, I've, I've been trying to uh, develop connections in public art and I've been working with um, uh, the artist David Franklin out of Seattle. And together we've completed a number of projects by now, um, but this one was the very first one. Um, I was the architect on this fire station, fire station 21. We hired um, David to be the public artist and then realized that we actually really liked um, working together and ended up sort of collaborating on that art project, which then led to a series of projects after that. Uh, but this was one of the first ones where I did grasshopper on a really large scale, um, fairly simple screen wall. Uh, but integrated um, into the architecture, which um, is one thing that we've uh, uh, we've been hired a lot for um, is finding things that are sort of um, appended onto architecture or attached to other elements, um, which introduces some really interesting uh, challenges and, and and problems in terms of um, yeah coordination. But I don't really want to talk about that one too much. Um, so this is uh, another one that we did uh, right after that drift inversion. They saw that we could, you know, hang some art from the side of a building. Um, and so in this case, there was a, uh, a pedestrian tunnel under a roadway that was connecting these developments in um, um, in um, in Denver, Stapleton, in, in the new Stapleton neighborhood in, in Denver. And um, and so you can see on the right hand side that lower area is like a, a, a pass through for um, uh, overflow rainwater. And then on the left is a kind of raised area where pedestrians can go through. And, um, and so we were really interested in thinking about the kind of um, landscapes that had been covered over and kind of lost in that area. Uh, it was an area that was full of sand dunes and then the um, Denver International Airport, which was then removed and now is this neighborhood. And so we like this idea of a, um, kind of imagined um, return to a dunescape. And um, if you have 150 feet or 100, 130 feet, I think, 130 foot um, tunnel that's continuous kind of monotonous extrusion of concrete, uh, introducing some uh, change and marking of uh, kind of transformation through that experience. And you'll see in here somewhere, um, you'll notice there are these little open, oh, you guys can't see my, in here, there are these little um, open areas. Those are, those are registering existing lights. So those became uh, a component that was um, uh, not an attractor, but a kind of repellent force um, in the creation of that um, that uh, the algorithm to, um, uh, to move the pattern away from um, those light sources. Um, a lot of these, you see, we're constantly like going back and forth between model and um, uh, and making. Um, so there you go, you can see like these are where the, the lights were kind of distributed through there. We had to stay away from those. Um, and then you can see the, um, the end result, uh, the end result there. So, and this thing is also um, 
made out of uh, aluminum and hung from the ceiling. And then that's um, actually David, uh, my uh, collaborator, the artist, um, as the scale figure there for that photo. Um, so uh, I've been trying to push, you know, we, we keep getting um, these jobs that um, people really like these kind of rippled, rippling patterns, but um, we're trying not to get bored and kind of repeating that and trying to find new challenges uh, in each of these projects, even if there is some sort of uh, similarity in terms of the aesthetic. Um, and this one was for a, a hotel in uh, San Jose. And what we looked at here, um, this is our first opportunity to do um, uh, this parametric method on a freestanding object. And so um, these are actually um, two-sided. They have contrasting patterns on either side and, um, and are um, freestanding self-supporting objects, um, which you can see here. Um, and this introduced some really interesting um, opportunities to kind of think through um, how to coordinate bolt hole locations, how to auto generate the top and bottom plates, which were um, uh, done in such a way by kind of sampling the thickness of those, those uh, vertical fins and um, making tangent connections. So when you, I don't think I have a close up of this, that would be nice, but you can kind of see there's a smooth kind of connection between the top and, um, and, that, and that plate. So, um, uh, and then this sits between a really kind of busy intersection and an outdoor seating area at that um, hotel and provides some, you know, sanctuary, I suppose. We don't really have good photos of this. Um, we're planning to get them at some point in the future, but these are, yeah, hasn't been well documented, unfortunately. But that one also led to one that I wanted to talk a little bit more in, more in depth uh, about. This is um, another one in San Jose um, at another hotel um, that we've been referring to as the Java Bordeaux. It has nothing to do with the concept of the project. We really haven't formally named the project. It's just re really the intersection where the project exists. So this is just a placeholder for the time being. Um, but here we have two different brand hotels. You know, it's kind of class thing, I assume, right? Like the good hotel and the better hotel. Uh, and they kind of sit um, at this intersection and they create this kind of public breezeway space in the middle. Um, and they, the developers decided that they wanted someone to put public art in there. And so we came in and suggested um, <clears throat> these kind of hanging features uh, that would divide the space up into a series of, of rooms. And so you can see here um, on this plan on the right, um, down here on the right, this is one of the hotels. The other hotel is over here, passageway through here. There's a, um, uh, the street corner is, is up to the right. And then you can see there's one piece here, a second piece right there, a third one here, and a fourth one here. So we have these four elements. Um, you can see their little deck platforms. And, um, and what we've created are these um, hanging structures that are, um, uh, we were thinking early on about um, kind of tapestry and fabric and the kind of folds that those make. Uh, and so that is what we were attempting to, um, to create there. And you can see it's kind of going through those uh, four different um, variations there on the right or the left. So um, this is, uh, again, just another definition. I was kind of you know, looking at this to present and started realizing this is just completely insane um, and hard to really track. But uh, you can see there's some consistency. A lot of the parameters are kind of driven by these um, sliders on the left. Um, if you, you know, kind of squint your eyes, you can start to see some repetition to this in that it's kind of striated, right? Like here's the fourth fin set across the top. Here's the third one running across here. They all kind of do the similar thing. The second one is here. And then the first one's kind of an oddball and it gets kind of its own, its own deal. But then as I was refreshing my memory about what I have done here, I started realizing that um, each one of these places where I've put the red circle is actually a cluster. And some of these clusters have clusters inside of those clusters. So we're actually just seeing, this is like a, a simplified version of everything that's going on. And so this is when, you know, I start like thinking about how to talk about this and I just sort of 
you know, lose my mind. Cause I'm like, holy shit, this is so complex. I don't even know like what to do, but I figured we could try and dive in a little bit and kind of look at it, um, some of the things we were trying to achieve. Um, so, um, oh, let me go back to up here in this space um, above this on the second floor is actually a pool. So there's actually a concrete deck up there and, uh, and a pool that presumably both hotels can access. And so um, we were given these uh, points up here that we could attach to. And we devised this hanging structure. Um, uh, and really the ceiling is actually essentially at this level. There are these little um, reveals that are about 18 inches deep that it, it sort of emerges out of. Um, but this was the kind of structural condition that we had to rely on. And then um, we're kind of hanging down from this. So we constructed what we thought of as a sort of uh, canvas um, to start to work on. Um, so we have a fairly simple shape. On the front, it's fairly flat. On the back, it's kind of a subtle, there's a subtle intasis just built into the, the base geometry, uh, kind of doubly curved surface. Um, primarily because the front of this, while it's very busy with folds, the back of it stays very smooth. Um, and uh, so we wanted to give it some kind of dynamism that if the one side is sort of um, folding in in a kind of concave way, the other side was kind of pushing out. Uh, and so we started looking at, um, uh, these, these are Bernini sculptures and looking at the fabric folds and thinking about how that could be not only just an inspiration, but literally start to use that in the process. Uh, but what we figured out was that this was way too complex to take a sample of this and use it uh, to make a, f a form. And I'm not going to show you all those, but there were s multiple um, really bad iterations of this. And what we finally realized is that we needed something incredibly simple to actually deform this in a way that was even legible. Um, and, and so we took a turn with the process and ended up making... Um, which we, this is kind of fun. We ended up making uh, Photoshop uh, image files and then literally kind of painting and using brush strokes and watching uh, and saving it and watching it update in here and looking at how that deformed the shape um, and then kind of evaluating it. So um, took a bit of a turn, but still trying to get this effect of a kind of fabric um, form. And you can kind of see that happening over there. Um, and this, of course, is, as you can see from these kind of inputs and, and output, is one of the clusters that's taking a lot of these inputs, um, dividing the form, evaluating it based on this image, and then, um, uh, yeah, deforming it out in, in essentially the normal direction, and then making sure it can stitch back together into a solid for the next step, which is essentially to slice that thing up. So that thing gets all sliced and diced, as you can see over here. Um, this is another one of those clusters that I was talking about. So when you open one of those uh, red circles from before, this madhouse is what you find inside of there. Um, and I don't think there are any more clusters in there, but I know it's, it's so zoomed out you can't even tell. Um, and so this was one of the parts that I thought was really hard, difficult or challenging from a, um, a kind of grasshopper coding perspective. Um, so the slicing of this is fairly simple. It's just a contour component, right? And it cuts it and you kind of figure out the angle and how you want to look at it. And, and that's pretty straightforward. But because this thing is hanging and um, this metal is really thin, it's uh, 316, is it 316 or eighth? I think it's eighth inch metal hanging about 25 feet. And so we needed supports between those. And we came up with a, um, uh, a threaded rod, it's actually an internally threaded rod system to connect uh, each fin together. And from our engineer figured out how far apart they could be. Um, and then wanted to develop a pattern into it so it wouldn't be just sort of random and haphazard. So those contoured fins are sliced, um, you know, horizontally and evaluated to find the position of each of those um, those uh, rods that are going to go between there. And so what became really challenging, as you can see over here on the left, is that it was evaluating the thickness of every single fin and evaluating that thickness relative to its partner next to it, and then finding the midpoint that would always be at a 90 degree angle between the two fins. So it's looking for the middle point 
of overlap between two pairs of fins. And then all, as you can see, it's also alternating, right? So that we don't have any two rods kind of sitting right into one another. And that's essentially what, what is happening in here um, in this structure. And you can see there's some kind of dead cells running through here, but that's essentially because uh, we were slicing this at different amounts. And um, at this point, we were doing a kind of dumb version uh, with, with this kind of exploding the tree. Uh, there's probably a more elegant solution to that, but it, it, it fit the bill, it, it worked. And it doesn't affect the overall, the, the end result of this. But that was one of the major issues here is like coming up with a pattern that we could slice, but then also bring stability in a way that was um, kind of well organized and then trying to figure out how to code that. In addition, as we got more and more information given to us um, specifically about how the um, top holes um, and the pick holes, so the pick holes are, these are going to be shipped out on a truck just flat and then um, they're going to uh, tie a little strap through this little mark right in the middle there and they're going to hoist these up and then they're going to sit a bolt through here and there's a top plate that's actually not shown. Um, and so as we were given information from the engineer, that information got fed into, um, into the definition. And so as we were continuing to like paint and um, you know, adjust the ripples and, and change that in a really kind of intuitive way, all this stuff would update automatically based on um, the kind of space and parameters that we had set in, in here. So we could always get really quick um, updates to, to those. Um, and there we go, and this is kind of looking, that this is inside of this one, which is also inside of something else, as you can tell from the purple background. So lots of kind of nesting. It's just, you know, at certain points, like things got so insane, you had to like cluster it, or it was just became incomprehensible. Um, and so this is looking at, it says whole spacing, but as you can tell, it really didn't, it wasn't a strict spacing. It was just more like one third, two thirds away from the ends to find the location of those two paired cir circles, which are where the bolt connections are gonna go that would hold, that would hang the rest of the structure. And then that ends up uh, looking like that. Um, and so while this top part here is not generated by Grasshopper, um, the rest of this is, as is the bottom plate, which is um, literally just a, a, a plate um, with slots cut into it that is more of a guide that keeps um, the piece from moving side to side. So it's actually able to uh, transit vertically, uh, but it doesn't move in any other direction. And then these are, um, are the foundation, which are just little, um, I wanna say four inch, maybe six inch diameter um, concrete tubes that we're just using to hold the bottom plate in place. And then all that gets buried by two inches of um, gravel or soil. I can't remember what they're putting in there. And, uh, and there you go. And so that's uh, one example of um, you know, the three major ones. And then the fourth one outside is, is a freestanding uh, version of that. So that you know, is, is one of the more kind of complex um, elements that we've been working on. I believe the height of these is just north of 20 feet, but I can't remember the exact height. Um, at the moment. Do you know how so, much they weigh? Uh, the weight? No, actually, you know, I don't remember. Our biggest thing lately has been the cost. I remember the cost, but I don't remember the weight. <clears throat> um, how much did they cost? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can have four of them for a hundred grand, apparently. Uh, that's a deal. Yeah, not bad. I mean, you know, like you yeah, think about metal. Like, the area of them, if they're like 25 feet tall and like you know 17 18 feet wide i think yeah and that's the other thing is that like working in this way it also allows us to get really large effects with really small amounts of material um there's one i didn't put in here that we did down in um uh san diego that um was another kind of rippling thing but the interesting thing there was figuring out how to reduce all waste and so it wrapped like three sides of a building and um, the definition, even though the sides weren't exactly the same in shape, we figured out a way to do it so that it would be a mirror image. And so when you're cutting out the pieces, one, one half of that cut would go to one side of the building, the other half would go to the other side of the building. We'd get these like inverse patterns running around it. So, you know, like that, that's one thing that we find kind of interesting is a kind of economy of means to like maximize effect, right? Yeah. Um, I had a question about the, um, 
the Photoshop thing that you used as sort of input data. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I really like that. I'm always sort of trying to figure out like intuitive ways to, to get data in there, right? Um, was it like, um, what, how was it to work with? Like if you had something that you kind of like and you just wanted to like change it a little bit, was that, was that easy or was that a big pain in the butt? I wish it was easier, but I got to say it got, it, it was better than, um, than it was at the beginning. Cause once right. I had, you know, like Photoshop open and could make those changes and if I saved it and wrote over that file, okay, then I don't know. I can't remember if it was automatic in terms of its refresh, but it was pretty quick. It was either like, going in and out of the, the, um, the algorithm, the, the grasshopper file, and then it would refresh and you'd see all that, those calculations happen. The biggest thing was, was really whether you wanted it to run through the whole algorithm or not. Like oh, yeah. if it ran through the whole thing, then, then you're waiting like a few minutes. But if you're just doing like, you know, to this stage, you right. can do it really quickly. Right, that makes sense. So you can iterate and get a nice form that you want and then have it go propagate the rest of the stuff. Yeah, and I, I was really excited about that. I, I mean, it seems like kind of a simple thing. And I've seen people use images to like recreate faces or whatever, but as a, as a way to kind of like paint and have that affect something in space, like I really like that. I had the, the, you know, the tablet out and was just like drawing, <laughs> drawing in Photoshop and then seeing how it would affect these. Yeah. Um, and then we could fine tune it too, where we'd start to, you know, notice that we had some sort of problem that would break the the algorithm we could come back and put a little more gray in and kind of back it off in certain areas and then and then the thing would work again it's not that it's not that um precious or kind of delicate but um there were a few moments where it um it deformed too much and it couldn't resolve it so cool yeah looks looks really useful yeah the um I, I trying to use grasshopper in a professional environment and with people who aren't familiar with it uh it, it, it's great to try it using these intuitive interfaces so they can affect the form without having to dive into the uh, definition, you know, yeah. just telling them to, you know, paint something and, and we'll just see what comes out of it. But being able to give them some way to, of interacting with it is always, uh, yeah, I guess a struggle, but, but totally, yeah, totally. a fun one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in working with someone else, like working with my friend, David, um, uh, like he doesn't know the computer at all. He's better with a chainsaw and a big chunk of wood than he is with like uh, a computer and a mouse, you know? Um, and I think that actually is where we really like work well together. And so um, finding ways for him to kind of understand what's going on and be a part of that process as we're kind of working through design ideas is, is really helpful as well. Um, and then, you know, the, on the back side of this, like these are, um, um, I, you know, I, I guess what I was going to show here is that this piece in the middle is literally what's coming directly out of Grasshopper. And I could have had it so that it would show up directly here. These are the actual construction documents and, and the files that we we'll use for fabrication. Uh, but I ended up, and actually all these that are in the boxes, um, but I ended up keeping it separate because I wanted to insert myself as the rational human who could double check everything and make sure there weren't any errors in there. And of course, there are a few right around here in this weird spot where I had to clip things. Uh, so this was my sort of, um, you know, the, the kind of air gap, uh, if you will, um, between, you know, the algorithm and the, the document to make sure that I got a, a way to kind of look over things uh, before it went out for construction. Mm. And this one, of course, has been waylaid by the um, by the pandemic and all that. So it's um, it's not going to happen for a little while, but um, but it will. Um, and then um, uh, David uh, is a glutton for punishment, so he took one for the team and went out and actually built um, scale models of this to make sure that it would it would work. Uh, which I'm glad he did. I just I didn't have the patience to do it. So uh, so I think these are like. 18 inches tall, maybe, I can't quite remember. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of a nice proof of concept that he was able to actually build these, all the pins went in, everything went up, you know, so he got to simulate essentially the construction method. Um, and then um, I think this might be the last, the last one, um, let me keep this short. This is another one that we're working on now. Um, and this is for, um, this was a um, kind of invited competition in Maryland for the um, Purple Line Transit Authority. They're putting in a new um, 
light rail line around Baltimore. That's not right, around Washington. I don't know, somewhere over there. And um, so they uh, invited a number of artists. I think there were 40 stations. They invited three or four artists per station to kind of compete to put art at that particular place. Um, and so we uh, made one for this location. Um, and um, we, it was kind of a weird thing. We didn't win, but we, we won anyway. So they had a different one that they really wanted for this particular location that you see here. Um, but they liked ours so much that they booted everyone from the adjacent one and gave us that one. So, uh, so we lost, but we ended up winning. Um, so this was our original idea. Um, both of those stations are really close to, um, the world's uh, longest continually operating uh, airport, um, which is where the Wright brothers, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry if I get this wrong, I think this is right. It's where the Wright brothers taught the Air Force how to fly. This just like sounds insane to even say that out loud, right? Um, and so uh, it's a center of kind of science and technology and innovation. And so we were really interested in thinking about how we could um, draw upon that legacy and kind of build something. Um, there were very few opportunities for where to build because we were kind of constrained by the, um, the light rail, which you see over here on the left. Um, and so they were really encouraging us to look into the idea of vertical elements. So we got uh, interested in this idea of a pylon and we're looking back at, um, both the kind of artifacts that they used to make, the propellers themselves and these kind of twisting structures that would allow you to rise into the air. Um, and, um, and specifically like looking at the, these shots from the airfield with these pylons and, that had counterweights up at the top. And that's actually how they would, they would set these rails on the ground and they would drop the counterweight and it would propel the plane forward so fast that it could take off, which is kind of wild. I mean, it sounds more like an aircraft carrier or something, right? Um, and so, uh, so we were really interested in this kind of vertical um, elements, uh, twisting, kind of thinking about something that starts off solid, uh, breaks down into something more open. Um, and, and this is pretty ambitious in terms of the, um, the kind of structure. And over time, we've kind of realized um, that there have been a lot of conversations. This thing has changed pretty radically. Um, I think we won this back in 2016 or 17. It's been a little while, and we still have like two or three more years to go. Um, but in that time, we've kind of realized that the, the budget that they've been talking about, which has changed a, a, a bit, um, at one point we're looking at graphics to go onto the glass of the rail station, which were going to be these graphics here, which were the plan and uh, elevation of the pylon itself. So you could kind of stand in the space between the plan and the elevation while you're looking out at the object itself, which we thought was kind of a, a, fun, a fun thing. Um, but ultimately, the budget wouldn't support this. They gave us cost information for what this was. It was way too much. And we realized we were going to have some serious funding issues for um, making the pylon itself. So we've, um, in the process of developing the structure, we became really enamored uh, by the, the kind of base structure that we had created. Um, and we had all those kind of elements kind of attached onto it. Uh, but over time, we've sort of whittled this thing down and, um, uh, you know, in our kind of process of going back and forth, like David wants to like make things physically, I'm kind of in here in the computer. Um, I made him a model, um, which I 3D printed and then bronze cast and was intending to ship up to him so that he could experiment with adhering um, panels to it so we could start to think about how to redo that. But in that process, we kind of became so enamored with the, um, the shape itself, uh, we decided to kind of uh, jettison a lot of that and look at how this panelized structure it's, uh, or shape itself could be both kind of structure and achieve that, um, that idea of going from something solid to something that's more open. Um, we were talking before, this, this got kind of messed up. I don't know what happened, it's super pixelated, um, but uh, but this is just in Rhino, and this is the um, grasshopper component that um, is, is one way that when I'm working with David, I can, if I can simplify that whole grasshopper madness down to like five sliders, you know, and we can kind of talk about those, it makes life a lot easier. And so you, you can see here where we can have a kind of conversation about how this design might um, 
develop uh, and we can kind of tweak that until we find one that, that we think is going to work. Um, and, you know, the other byproduct of this was that um, we became really um, fascinated by the metal um, and the kind of metallic surface. I mean, definitely also the 3D printed um, uh, patterning as well, but that may be for a future project. Um, and so what we've started to do is look at um, definitions that, um, that are more kind of metal, potentially even um, reflective as you can see here, and the latest um, iteration of this you can see is um, completely closed uh, at the bottom, except for a little tiny strip, but um, theoretically closed, and then uh, gets lighter and lighter until it gets um, completely open. And so what we're looking at right now are a series of um, triangulated panels that will be made out of sheet metal, um, possibly welded or riveted. We're kind of going back and forth about that but that completely hide the structure. So at the moment, the structure is an eight inch, um, that's the preliminary idea, it's an eight inch um, steel tube. It's welded to a structure below grade and rises up about to here, I think, to about 20 feet. And then the last bit of this is just cantilevered. And then the rest of these elements will be um, vertical pieces that'll extend out from there. Uh, that will allow us attachment points for um, that, that covering. And then this meets, you know, it's, it's going to be fairly impervious to um, all the people who uh, try to vandalize it. Uh, and maybe we'll hopefully uh, keep the idiots from climbing it um, because it starts out as a kind of slippery, kind of completely closed surface and really only opens up into something you might be able to get a handhold on uh, at about 12 feet. So, uh, Hopefully that'll keep people from doing dumb stuff. Um, and so that's, that's the one that um, we're working on. Oh, I guess that's it. That's the one we're working on right now. And I was thinking, I went through um, and tried to find the grasshopper definitions that are like the least um, insane. Uh, and I found two, uh, one of which is, is this object and the other one is the, the kind of spinning chandelier from at the beginning. But I'm gonna put those up on the, um, uh, on, the, on the, whatever it is, the Google Drive. And um, if you all wanna look at it, critique it, uh, make fun of it, whatever. Um, uh, those are the two that I think would be the easiest to sort of see the kind of logic and maybe experiment with it and, and play around with it. Um, but that's uh, that's all I did have. So you had a grasshopper de grasshopper definition that goes all the way to that um, steel sculpture that you, you were just showing us. This one. Yeah. Yes. Pretty cool. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. In fact, I think I might I still have it open. I don't know if I have it open. Oh yeah. Mm. Uh, no, that's the wrong one. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's one of them, and then the other one is um, is that one, which doesn't want to. Doesn't want to play nice, apparently. It's in there somewhere. There it is. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and it's a little slow. I admit I uh, I lied. Um, uh, parts of this uh, are clipped together, and some of this is at eight hundred percent speed uh, because um, uh, it takes a little bit for it to kind of go go through there. Um, so, so grasshopper being slow is not my poor coding abilities. There's just sort of no way around it, even on fast computers a lot of the time. Yeah, I mean, I like to think I have a pretty fast computer, um, but there are moments where it kind of, it lags. Um, it's definitely hard to go back to the laptop after mm. working on the desktop. I think that's when you start getting into meshes, isn't that right? When it starts getting real complicated. Into meshes, yeah. That would probably be a good way to Yeah, go. meshes are super, super they're faster. Mm. Yeah. But they're, yeah, they're just crappier. They just look yeah. worse. And I do think that's actually where this needs to go at the end. It's going to have to get meshed just to um, kind of triangulate and get things down to flat planes so we can see where we need, where the bends are going to be. There might be a little bit more triangulation with the, the twisting of this. I think um, each, of those, each of those panels is going to have to be divvied up into flat planes. I'm not sure everything's 100% flat at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was interested to, to hear about how those pipes that are the actual interior, like internal structure, how those will be fabricated because the, each of those twists are pretty specific. 
Yeah, I mean, that's what I find so interesting, right? It's, it's a gradient from the top to the bottom, and you can kind of see in here, it's, it's a gradient that's controlled by this um, Bezier curve. And so it starts off, you know, solid for a long time, and then, you know, it gets, um, it's, not, it's not consistent in terms of, um, you know, being full to, to nothing, right? It, it sort of ramps up um, in terms of its openness. But I guess the thinking is that we'll have two sheets from either side that will just clamp on around that center structure. Um, but yeah, it's it's a next step we haven't really gotten to. This this project's on the um, on the slow road. It's like got a 2022 kind of um, trajectory. So it's you know it's a slow one. Mm -hmm. It looks really cool. It looks like it's giving you the time to sort of, you know, develop some something new that, that responds to their um, yeah. limitations. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm kind of excited about both the kind of simplicity of this, but also the potential elegance of this kind of like, you know, um, this solution. Um, the first one is like kind of uh, insane, um, like frenetic, like so much energy and kind of weirdness in there. Like it was fun. I guess that's one of the things that I've been trying to like temper my uh, our work with is that you know like you can make some really out of control stuff in in um in grasshopper but when you have to build it it sort of changes your approach to it um and so we've been trying to kind of like get increasingly complex and more sophisticated in our approaches but also like we're always constrained with how to build it right and and to do it in a way that that is um that has some some craft to it, I suppose, right? Whatever that might mean in a metric context. Yeah, yeah. I spend a lot of time thinking about that. You like very quickly get to things that are just just impossible, or you know, require like ridiculous amounts of three D printing, which is never going to actually work out, or like um, you know, like cutting tubing and welding it together with you know com com complex complex angles. It's just like that's not going to actually happen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the slices thing, I feel like, um, comes up pretty quickly. Like, that's, that's something that, like, works out really well. Yeah, and, and I've been trying to push away from that. I mean, there are only so many times that you can just be like, and now we're going to contour it, you know? Like, right. at a certain point, that just, you know, I think I, we keep um, saying to each other that, you know, that we're not going to do slices on the next project, right? We keep trying to kind of push away from that because, you know, you don't want to get kind of typecast and, you know. Well, have you seen um, Julian Vos Andre's art? No, I don't think so. Um, he's a Portland sculptor. Um, he does figurative sculpture. Um, he'll digitally scan people and then make um, similar uh, slices um, vertically. So you, you look on it, you look at, at it straight on and it sort of disappears. Because uh, you're looking through the slices, yeah. Um, and he um, he likes to make a fuss about how he was trained in quantum mechanics, and so that sort of inspired the the there or not there kind of a thing. I wish ours was that deep. That's that's yeah, great. <laughs> a little bit of a stretch, but um, but yeah, he's really milked that. He's he's done pretty well for himself. He's what was his last name? Uh, v o s s uh, hyphen a n d r a e. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, this one essentially in the original drawing, it's 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 pretty pretty fun if it if it ever happened. Um, yeah, you can see lots of internal structure there. I, I, that that sort of gives it like the the frenetic thing. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and we start you know we started talking to fabricators, and the second they start the second they started looking in there, they're like, "What is happening in there?" I'm like, "Oh, it's you know it's like a space frame, right? You know, you just weld up all these pieces, and you could just see the like you know the cash signs just like you know rising out of their head like." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was um that was a tough one. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's it. I mean I didn't show everything, but there's a lot of, you know, this is the kind of basics of, of what we've been doing for the last uh whatever it's been, like six years or something, seven years. Were the, were, were, I had a question about the um the previous project at the in between the hotels. Yeah. That slot, that vertical slot. Or, or or just in general seismic concerns um yeah um i think that's that's why we ended up getting um that base plate down at the bottom so um that plate down at the bottom is uh is anchored um uh, into the ground and um it keeps it from from swaying um 
but it allows it to kind of deflect vertically. So the second floor as it's, as it's moving isn't gonna impact anything down below. And so, yeah, this thing is completely um, suspended from up here and this is just a stabilizing element so that the whole thing doesn't just, you know, swing out like a pendulum and, and then slice somebody out like an egg slicer or something. E, yikes, yeah, yeah, tomato slicer. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Any number, yeah. Yeah. What's cool about this one, it almost looks like a uh, it, like you guys are zooming in in the same way that you did with the uh, Bernini sculpture into like the details of what was before, um, you know, droplets along the Willamette, you know, before the form was maybe something that you knew uh, you yeah. could recognize, but this one being, yeah, I guess something that you, you don't. Just yeah, and in that way, I think this one's more like the kind of drift inversion under the bridge, where it is more a little more fluid and organic. And um, I, I yeah, I'm, I don't want to get stuck in those kind of rigid kind of water drop the figural qualities of that as as being a um, uh, a way to make recognizable geometry. I guess you know. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's 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 un, it's like a really great way to build though. You know, um, there's one guy, I don't know his name. He, uh, his name came up or I became familiar because he was one of the finalists for PS1, one of these years, but he does these sort of, I guess, interesting, just laser cuts paper, you know, and stacks mm -hmm. them up and creates these just incredibly, incredibly complicated. I've seen those. Columns, basically, yeah. Yeah, those are amazing. They're crazy. They're yeah. just incomprehensible, you know? I mean, they almost are, you know, by design, are not comprehensible by human beings. The computer designed this. But then just, you know, they're just like laser cut paper, which is like, we've been, or, you know, uh, could be, you know, just a rolling blade, but uh, that's like World War II technology. So the two coming together in such a, such a way is really interesting. Yeah, and I, I, the thing I love about that too is that the paper is just stacked. And so you get just continuity of form and it, it doesn't look like you've lost anything. And we keep coming up against, you know, the, the, um, the difficulty of like um, material cost, right? And so suddenly those fins either go like a greater spacing or a closer spacing, depending on how things start playing out in terms of, of uh, fabrication costs, right? Um, cause ideally, you know, like what we've realized is like the closer we can keep those, the better the, um, the, the, uh, the shape is, is legible. Right. Right. Higher resolution. Higher resolution. Exactly. Yeah. Um, sure. which is why I think, you know, these are totally out of chronological order, but which is why I really, even though it was like the smallest and maybe the cheapest one that I've done, the, um, that faceted gyroid, I, I find to be really interesting because it's, it's looking at surface rather than it is like a, uh, a, a cross section, right? I wanna do some more with that um, at some point. Yeah, that would be like a rapid, yeah, fabrication so you can you know, get more iterations out of it. Yeah, wherever that one went, I'm gonna give you, make you guys dizzy going back through that. Oh wait, I think it was, it's easier going this way. Yeah, that thing. And of course, that, that completely relies on someone else's plug-in to be um, feasible. Um, but, you know, I'm glad they did it. Um, so if you guys have ever seen Ivy, um, it's a really interesting um, kind of mesh triangulation and kind of uh, mapping and um, tab system. Um, but I had never seen anyone actually build anything out of it. So I wanted to see what would happen when you try to actually scale that up and turn it into a, an actually physically constructed object. Um, um, like what was the scale of each panel on those? Like how big was the thing? Uh, well, the whole thing is about seven feet tall. Mm -hmm. um, and well, that's my garage when I was renovating it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a bicycle for scale in there, if that helps. Yeah, cool. um, I want to say they were like two feet, maybe Two and a half at the most. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a here's a sharpie for scale right there. <laughs> yeah, something like that, or a tape and, measure. There's a tape measure if that helps. 
And the plugin did a pretty good job of generating tabs that were actually, that, that worked and were useful. That's cool. It did, yeah. There was some user error here or there, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, the, I can't blame the computer. If anything, it was just me sure. messing stuff up. Is that thing still in your garage? No, oh my God, no, uh, <laughs> no, it's gone. But you know, the funny thing is, it was, uh, they, they, keep, um, they keep pulling it out every year. So they put it, it's, it, it, and to be perfectly honest, there are two of them. They're, they're a pair, they're like Frankenstein, you know, or not Frankenstein, <laughs> they're like twins. Um, one of them is, um, this is before the finish, but one of them is kind of bare um, sandblasted metal. And then the other one is painted. Uh, and they store them in a barn somewhere in uh, outside of Wilsonville. Who knows? Maybe it's burned down by now. I don't know. Uh, but then they they bring it out every year. Every every year they have the um, the festival. They somebody oh. goes and gets it and brings it out. You just have a barn for that. Kind a of pretty thing. one though. Yeah. Um, what did you think about um, like in the finished product after the painting and everything? You can still see the tabs. Um, mm -hmm. How did how did you feel about that? Like. Um, I, uh, I really liked it. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's a weird thing, but I, I guess in a way it seemed like some honesty about the construction of yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you look, you know, if I had, if I had more time, this turned out to be really difficult to build in the, both in, with the budget and the amount of time that I had, the rivets aren't, aren't concealed or, um, painted at all. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but no, I really liked that because I think it made, um, the pattern a little more um, legible than it was in the one that was all the same. And, um, and I think, I can't remember, I, there was some logic about which ones were um, painted, which color, because ultimately what it came down to by, because it, it, it's this kind of repeating pattern, right? The, the gyroid. And by simplifying it down, I got it to the point where um, I want to say there were like five panel types and only five angles throughout, or wait, yeah, I think three or five angles throughout the entire assembly. Cool. So there's a lot of repetition to it, even though, you know, depending on how you shoot it, it looks very different. And I found that really interesting as well, because I, I went to go make the jigs and I did this analysis of the mesh and it came up with five numbers. And I was like, how is that possible? It only has like those angles. Um, and so I like the, there's, uh, there's a three color scheme to this and um, and they basically register the three different types of panels that that come out of that. Oh, I see. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the coloring is really nice. Um, also, both the coloring and the um, the tabs give it the sort of like, um, like youthful sort of crafty paper craft vibe. I mean, so I have here, I'll just show you because it's right here. Um, Oh yeah. Oh, that's so much better. What is that? A Halloween mask that I made. I bought a pattern from somebody on Etsy, printed oh it out and put it together. And they, they had presumably done it by hand, but yeah, it's just like that sculpture is just like the exact same thing. Well, if we're having uh, Halloween this year, which I don't know if we are, uh, that seems like a good challenge. I should do something like that. That's you that could, looks awesome. You could, uh, oh yeah, that was, that was pretty fun. It didn't make a good costume, but that's okay. You can, no. You could turn your head into a into a gyroid. Yeah, I love that. I love that idea. And theoretically, I think we'd be able to get three people's heads in there. They're like three columns of, of space moving through there, and they never touch. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah, thank you for for presenting. This was really interesting. Um, yeah. Would you mind throwing? Oh. I got I, I forgot to ask earlier. I started recording this. I hope everybody's okay with that. Nobody's oh. in the witness protection program. Hopefully I didn't say anything wrong. I don't know. Yeah, your students will hear hear about yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Um yeah, and it it would be neat to see these slides too. Oh. And and I guess it same goes for you, Dan. Um oh, yeah. just to sort of like yeah, look back through them and mm -hmm squint and try and make out the definitions. I really liked your organization. Uh, oh, seemed uh, it, of the of the presentation or of the grasshopper definitions? Oh, no, yeah, of the, uh, yeah, <laughs> I just, I, I guess that's what I, I like seeing how other people organize these definitions. Oh, they yeah, yeah. Really complicated and, and it's interesting that, that Aaron uses clusters. I stay away from them. I hate going into them and, and yeah. doing anything. 
Okay, so I felt that way for a long time until I did that last project and I was, it just got so crazy. Yeah. yeah. I, I did one project that I really needed to use them because I was using a bunch of code over and over and over again in different places. Um, but Grasshopper, um, I, that's like, I really wish it had a better abstraction mechanism, like really, really a lot. Um, clusters are not great. Yeah. I was thinking, um, I, 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 do you guys feel, how do you feel about your data tree skills? Is it something or? Getting better. Pretty, pretty good. Pretty They're good. difficult. Yeah. 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 They definitely are. But, but when you get a handle on them, like try and you know, get, you get to start to avoid some of that repetition. You just put mm -hmm. everything into the same bucket and then filter it out on the other side or something. The, um, the path mapper has been my latest. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. To try and figure out. <laughs> Um, it's, still kind of makes my head hurt, but man, it's, <laughs> it's opened up some interesting possibilities. Yeah. I usually use that when I end up like, um, like I'll build a, a pat, like a chain of grasshopper objects to do a thing one time. And then I'll want to like take that and then do it like n times all at once with the same thing. And oftentimes I'll need to use the path mapper in there because I'll do like a flatten or a flip or something. And I, I, I only want to flip part of it or something oh, like that's that. that's cool. Yeah, that's what I usually end up using that for. Huh. You have to they show also got, some time. Yeah, they got a split tree and uh, relative uh, items is also a really fun one to mess mm -hmm. around with. What are, are those you? Where you can uh, start to match things from different trees with relative items or even, you know, uh, match things within the same list, you know, different trees within the same list. Um, but, but what's cool about it is that you can give it different patterns. Um, so the masking part, uh, you would just type out, you know, the path that you want. So like zero comma one, you know, mm -hmm. with the weird brackets on either side. Uh, you could also type zero, or, or I guess it's semicolon, uh, zero semicolon, you know, zero comma two comma dot dot dot, and it'll just assume that you're wanting all the even numbers, which I found very, um, I guess, helpful. You yeah. can give it a whole bunch of wild card, uh, you know, question mark, asterisk, you know, whether you want any of them or specific ones. I don't know. It starts to get interesting. It almost begins to be coding, and then you... Might as well just be doing that. Do you, um, have you written any of your own sort of, I guess, scripts or outside of Grasshopper, Aaron? Have you, I guess. Looks like I haven't put Rhino Nest on here for three years. Um, I have not. Um, I am not very good with uh, Python. I'm actually trying to uh, brush up on that. I should brush up. I'm trying to learn that. Let me be <laughs> frank. Uh, um, so Justin, sorry, I just saw you didn't have a mic and you, he was saying, do you have, do you find that Ivy was pretty helpful or did you have to edit a lot to make it work for production? Um, so you can see here, this is the one that I was saying, I was trying to go from like nothing all the way through. I stole the definition that this guy used in millipede for a gyroid and then reduced it. And then all of this is broken for some reason, which I'll have to dig into, but, um, you can kind of see uh let's see i think this is the construction yeah this is all rhino nest down here which means that the yeah this is actually the um the ivy stuff in here so it was fine um it rolled straight through there i scaled it down to build the the little model this is the full size one to um actually fabricate it and um and i haven't been in here in a long time but somewhere in here is um Presumably, oh yeah, there we go. There's the there's the one inch equals six inches scale fabrication, not a not an architectural scale. And then these are the the full size ones. So <clears throat> it was totally fine. Sent it to a fabricator. They cut it out. Um, got it back a week later, um, and then destroyed my garage for the next you know few months or weeks. Yeah, weeks. Um, but there you can see like this is. Um, not actually Ivy, but this is uh, the, oh, I don't even remember the name of the plugin. It's like Mesh Plus or one of the Mesh uh, extensions. That is not it. Um, I'm not going to remember what it was, uh, but it would, uh, it would calculate the angles. And so you can see here that, you know, there's 95, 168, 
um, the, the angles there aren't very many of them and they just kind of repeat. And, and there are, there are my, oh yeah, five angles. There were the five angles that I needed for fabrication. Um, so, you know, it, it, Ivy, it, I couldn't have done it without I, Ivy, I don't think. Um, mostly because of the tab production, but um, I think mostly because of that. I don't know. Did you, did you put it together yourself in your garage? I did. I'm cool. kind of a glutton for punishment. Uh -huh. um, so you, you, did you like make guides for those angles or something? How did you bend it and get it, get those correct? I did. Um, in fact, uh, I, when, as I was putting this together, I, I came across some uh, images and if you give me half a second, I'll show you uh, what that looked like. Um, because, uh, let's see, almost there, it's buried deep. Um, I think I have it. Oh, maybe I don't. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. I went, to the wrong, I went down the wrong rabbit hole, I think, to find those. Um, yeah, but I ended up making jigs, and then um, uh, there was a place on campus that had um, a break that I could use over in the engineering department. So <clears throat> I just made friends with the guy who ran the shop over there, um, and then went over and um, and just uh, just cut them right there. Um, and of course, now I can't find it. Ah, anyway, you get the idea though. Mm -hmm. What were the inputs again for these shapes? I was, um, I ended up just taking, uh, as a starting point, um, this guy, uh, kind of an elusive dude, he made this amazing set of, um, extensions called Millipede. And then I, um, I just took that, but he hasn't updated it. A guy like dropped off the grasshopper radar like years ago, uh, which is why I got that error message when I first started up. Um, but his, and, and he somehow figured out how to like code these. So his stuff all looks really weird. So you can see it really easily when, when somebody's put it into their definition. Uh, Cause it ends up looking like that. Um, I end up keeping them out of my definition definitions just because I, I hate the way they look <laughs> yeah so, i've been trying to keep so, my definitions as kind of simple as possible um i was trying to remember where i simplified that no i'm not seeing it um yeah it, this is what happens when you don't look at this stuff for a series of years um oh god that must be it there that's already reduced, so I guess we'd probably want to look at that. Maybe? Nope. Oh, right. And these are all the definitions that were embedded in there, right? There's the trigonometric uh, equation that's the approximation of a gyroid. And I went through it just for fun and was like trying all these different ones out and see how those would work. Um, oh, God. Too many of that. Anyway, so sorry. You guys probably don't want to watch me just like go through. Um, all this. But thought, Have you found any good? It, it sounds like you probably also go to Wolfram Alpha and like, or Math World, whatever they call it, and just like look at cool equations and put them into something. I don't remember how I got just to the gyroid for this or why. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't remember where why I was even interested in that at this point. Um, I think I was looking for mathematical equations as a way to construct a completely um, self-referential world inside a um, grasshopper. And when this did use to function, um, it was it was totally autonomous. It didn't have anything in Rhino, and so you know it would it would take the, you know basically run from from that from that you know equation all the way to construction documents. So as an experiment for myself, I was really interested in that idea of just kind of keeping it um, completely enclosed, right? And, and I guess the math equation was a way to do that. So I didn't have to have, you know, rhino geometry or, or whatever. Input curves. Yeah, no input curves, exactly. Yeah. I feel like gyroid is a thing that like some people get really obsessed with. I never quite figured out why. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess it, it makes, you know, uh, 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I was interested in it because it looked like it could make something um, potentially structural was, mm -hmm. was kind of the thinking. Um, the initial idea was to try and make something that people could climb on, but of course you make it out of sheet metal and suddenly it's like really easy to just like slice off thin pieces of skin, you know? Um, so having children crawl on that didn't seem like such a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I think I found it from, um, Oh man, who's the Japanese architect who did that library that's completely made out of like gyroid structures? Uh, it's escaping me at the moment, but I think that's what I had, had seen. I'd seen it used as the structure for a building and uh, I wanted to make one. I wanted to figure out how to make one, but I couldn't make it smooth. So I had to like okay. simplify it. Yeah, unless you're gonna pixelate it like yeah, how, how are you going to fabricate something big like that? So yeah, if you're going to pixelate it, pixelate it really big. <laughs> I mean, that would be, I've, I've seen um, some uh, architects and artists do really small paneled versions of shapes like this. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, Rob Lay did one out at the, um, the Oregon Zoo, which is beautiful. And it's made of, sh of pieces that are maybe about the, you know, that large, right? And um, and it must have a thousand wow. components to it. And I would love to be able to kind of scale up and find how to do that. But I think it's going to take a little more skill on my part in terms of like coding and Python and, um, and a lot more labor. <laughs> labor particularly. Yes. Um, when I've used Python with uh, Grasshopper, I use it for like, um, not for handling larger numbers of things or anything like that. Grasshopper is pretty good at that on its own, but just like, a lot of the time there's some stupid data munging thing that I just feel like will take too many boxes in Grasshopper and just a few lines of code. So I'll, I'll, it sometimes saves some work in that way. Yeah. Um, but Grass Grasshopper is pretty good at hand handling large numbers of little things on its own. Yeah, that's cool. Cool. So um, we're calling so it. What you, oh, or sorry, if you got a. Um, I was going to say uh, one one time. I'm not sure how 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 we could do it, but it'd be, it'd be nice to actually talk um, like talk about Grasshopper more directly sometime. Figure out a good topic yeah. like data trees or something like that. Mm -hmm. That'd be awesome. Um, I wonder what would be what would be a good topic. Um, I mean, data trees would be a good start uh anything I'm trying to think of what would jump to mind i think or even you know sharing general, extensions kangaroo. that you've been looking at mm -hmm. yeah uh, i've never heard of ivy as an novice, anything is nice from justin total yeah yeah i'm open to any of that i think that would uh, be, yeah. be great yeah we should uh we should make our definitions um, available to one another and then we can uh, tear them apart and have a roast or someday. Right. <laughs> yeah. Why would you graft here Definitely. when you're just doing? Yeah. <laughs> Why would you do that? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I like that well, idea though. Being able to talk, yeah, specifically about grasshopper and perhaps even, I don't know, challenges. You know, I know that I personally don't do anything the right way but I'm sure I've been doing it the wrong way, you know, a long time and it works, but. Yeah, I'm not sure what the right way even means in something like Grasshopper, like if it gets the effect, you know, I think you've won, you should just, you know, go with it. Yeah, it's like Photoshop. Sure. Uh, Photoshop layers are, yeah, very personal. <laughs> Cool. All right. Uh, all right. Um, well, yeah, if you want to make any and all of that available to us via the uh, Google groups, that would be really cool. I, yeah, I I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, I'll do that this evening. Cool. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I made it so that anybody could upload files to the, um, to the Google Drive thing. If you have any trouble, uh, let me know. Oh, yeah, I haven't tried. I did download yours. Thank you. Cool. Great. Glad that worked. Um, but yeah, I'll let, I'll let you know if I run into a problem. Cool. Yeah. 
So next month, uh, Jeff Sosby wasn't with us today, but next month, I was going to try and get him to present some of the cool stuff that he did when he was working in New York. He's been working at Lever lately. I had hoped that he'd been using those like cool milling machines in some sort of that would be awesome. way, but yeah, but he, he thinks that uh, the more compelling stuff will be, um, or at least the more grasshopper specific stuff will be stuff that he's worked on in New York, which are of course awesome. Oh, are you muted? Sorry. Oh. Oh, you were talking to somebody else? Yeah, I, my daughter came in, decided she oh, okay. to share something. <clears throat> right on. Cool. Uh, but yeah, I was going to see if he could uh, present to us uh, next, next, next time. Yeah. That'd Otherwise, cool. I'll just, I'll do it myself. Yeah. Got a million things I'd love to show. But uh, okay. That all sounds good. Yeah, okay. Awesome. All right. Thanks again, Aaron. Uh, this was really cool. I was really, yeah. really enjoyed this. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks yeah. for letting me uh, show you that stuff. Oh, of course. Yeah. All right. All right. Until Stay next time. There. Yeah. yeah. Hold your Good breath, luck, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. All right. See you all later. Bye.